All right, welcome everybody. I want to welcome you to our sixth lesson in the series of lessons on shock. And in this lesson, we're going to begin our dive into the category of shock types that we refer to as distributive shock. And my name is Eddie Watson, and I am going to be your presenter for this series of lessons. And so as always, in order to stay up to date on our lessons as they become available, make sure and subscribe to our channel below. And also don't forget to hit that bell icon in order to be notified when those new lessons become available. Okay, so when we talk about distributive shock, we're really talking about three different types of shock states. We can divide that up into anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, and septic shock. Now each of these types of shock has their own causes and unique pathophysiology, but essentially the underlying cause for the shock state is going to be very similar. And so what's going to end up happening in distributive shock is you're going to end up with excessive vasodilation as well as you're going to have leaky blood vessels. And so again for the three types of distributive shock that we're going to talk about they all are going to achieve this as well as other things through different processes but these two things that excessive vasodilation and the leaky blood vessels are what's going to contribute to that shock state. All right, and so with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the first type of distributive shock that we are going to talk about, and that is going to be anaphylactic shock. And so like with all the rest of these that we've done, we are going to break this down into its root words, which we can break down into ana and phylaxis. Ana essentially means against, and phylaxis is protection. And so really you can think about anaphylactic shock as being a shock that's a result of our immune system. So our body's protection system, but at this point it's now working against our own body and our own processes. And so really to sum up what's happening in anaphylaxis is you end up with some sort of allergen. And when the body sees this and responds to this, you end up with a massive release of what we call histamine. And so this allergen can really come in many forms. It can be either something that's injected, it can be ingested, or it can even be absorbed through the skin. But essentially the end result is that that allergen will enter into the bloodstream and trigger a cascade of events that will ultimately lead to a shock state. And these allergens can come in many forms. It can be food allergies such as peanuts or shellfish, uh, it can be from bee stings, uh, or even medications that we give. And so now if we look at the causes for anaphylactic shock, there's essentially two types which we are going to break down further here in just a minute. The first and most common one is going to be the immunologic. And this is going to be what we refer to as anaphylaxis. And the second one is going to be our non-immunologic. And this is what you're going to hear referred to as anaphylactoid. And so again, important to note, anaphylaxis or the immunologic response is going to be the most common. All right, so at this point, let's go ahead and talk about what's actually happening inside of our body with these reactions. So here we're going to go ahead and draw out a blood vessel. And so the first one we're going to talk about is our immunologic reaction or the anaphylaxis. So essentially you end up with this allergen that has now entered into the bloodstream. And so the first time that your body sees this, what's going to happen is it's going to interact with a B cell. And the whole purpose of this B cell is to recognize this allergen and to create these proteins that we call antibodies. And they're essentially these Y-looking proteins. And they're also referred to as IgE. And these antibodies' main purpose is to be able to interact with the allergen. And so what happens after this first exposure and the creation of these antibodies is these antibodies will go and they'll attach to our mast cells. 
And these mast cells are really what's known as our immune system mediators. And so when this happens and this process goes through its course, this is what we call being sensitized. And so in order for this reaction to progress to an anaphylaxis reaction or anaphylactic shock, is we're actually going to have to have another exposure to this same allergen. And so once again, the allergen will enter into the blood system. And now what will happen is that allergen will actually go, and because of these antibodies that were produced, and what will happen is the allergen will go ahead and bind to one of the antibodies on one of the mast cells. And this is really where the cascade of events begins to take place. And so the first thing that happens is it's going to release these cytokines. And the whole point of these cytokines is to recruit our white blood cells. And so when these white blood cells and mast cells come together, what you're going to get is a massive release of histamine. And so what's going to happen is this histamine is going to bind with a couple histamine receptors. We have our, our H1 and our H2 receptors. And so when the histamine binds with these receptor sites, each one's going to have their own unique response. And so when we talk about the H1 receptor site, the first of these that we're going to see is an increase in our capillary dilation. And so really, if we go back to our blood vessel here, if we think about that, we're talking about an increase in the size of this capillary. And so this is going to cause these vessels to dilate out which is going to increase their size. And again, you've got to think that this is happening systemically throughout the entire body. And so this is going to ultimately lead to a massive drop in our systemic vascular resistance, which essentially means we are going to have a massive drop in our blood pressure. So the next thing that we're going to see is an increase in our capillary permeability. And so what's happening is these cells in the endothelial lining, the spacing in between them is going to start to open up. And this is going to cause fluid from our intravascular space to leak out of our blood vessels. And when this fluid leaks out and collects up out here, this is going to cause swelling. And once again, this is happening throughout the entire body. So you're going to have swelling throughout the entire body. The next thing that we're going to see specifically with the H1 receptors is we're going to see an increase in the bronchial smooth muscle cell contraction. And so in the lungs, what you're going to see is bronchoconstriction. And so when you take this combined with the swelling that you're also going to see as a result of those leaky blood vessels around the airway, this is where you're going to begin to really get concerned for your patient's ability to support their own airway. And finally, the fourth and last thing that we will see as a result of the H1 activation is you're going to see a decrease in the conduction of the AV node. So now with our H2 receptor site active, the first you're going to see an increase in our gastric acid produ production. And so you're going to have a buildup of the gastric acid in your patient. This could also lead to nausea and vomiting for them, and ultimately an aspiration risk. But the other thing that you could also see as a result of this is our vascular smooth muscle relaxation. And so again, this smooth muscle relaxation is going to lead to a further decrease in our SVR and ultimately a further decrease in our patient's blood pressure. And so that essentially is what's going on with the immunologic response and what is ultimately leading to our shock state. Now for the second cause, this is our non-immunologic, or what we call the anaphylactoid response. The important distinction to note with the anaphylactoid is unlike the anaphylaxis reaction, this doesn't require an initial sensitization. So essentially what happens is again we have some sort of allergen that enters into the bloodstream, but what happens in this case is this allergen is going to interact directly with a receptor on the mast cell, and this is again going to trigger that same cascade of events of releasing cytokines and recruiting white blood cells, ultimately leading to the massive release of histamine, and ultimately the same concerns and conditions that would lead to the state of shock that we just discussed. Again, very important to note though that the anaphylactoid reaction can happen on the first time a person is exposed to this particular allergen, as opposed to with the anaphylaxis reaction, 
They're going to have to have that initial exposure in order to be sensitized and then have a second exposure in order to trigger this cascade of events. And so now let's go ahead and talk about some of the signs or symptoms that your patient might exhibit. And so just like with every other type of shock, you're going to have a decreased blood pressure or hypotension. The other important sign that you're going to see massively and systemically with your patient is that swelling. As the body attempts to compensate for this hypotension, you're going to see an increased heart rate. And again, as a result of the histamine release, you're going to have the bronchoconstriction. They may also have flushing of the skin, itchiness, and rhinorrhea, which is a runny nose. And again, as the shock state progresses and continues, you will see all of the typical signs that you would see in a patient who is exhibiting shock, which we did cover in the first lesson. And so finally now, let's go ahead and move on to our treatment. And so for our treatment, there's going to be several things that we're going to be looking for or trying to do. And so the first of these, and probably the, the most important, is as you can remember with this type of shock, one of the things that you're most notably going to see is, is that swelling throughout the entire body, and particularly that combined with our bronchoconstriction that we're really going to be concerned for our patient's airway. So we're going to make sure we're focusing on our patient's ABCs. So airway, breathing, circulation. And this ultimately could mean intubation and ventilation. Now, for really our first line treatment for a patient with anaphylactic shock is going to be the initiation of epinephrine. And so here, what we're really looking for is that sympathetic response. And so here we're going to be looking for that constriction of blood vessels to increase our SVR, as well as we're going to be looking for the response of the bronchodilation. And these two things are going to work to open our patient's airway, as well as supporting their blood pressure. And when we talk about the administration of epinephrine, the first line is to go with the intramuscular injection. And then if we find ourselves in a state of cardiovascular collapse that hasn't been responsive to the IM injection, then that's when we might consider uh, IV form of the medication as well. So next we're going to want to look at giving our patients IV fluids. And so think back to those leaky vessels, the fluid has shifted out of the intravascular space. And so we want to look to replace that. And we also might look at giving them a medication in the class of an antihistamine. And our primary medication is going to be directed at the H1 histamine receptor sites. So this is going to be our Benadryl and other things of that sort. But you may also find times where giving a medication that has an impact on the H2 receptor sites, and this would be something like a Zantac, which is normally going to be used to reduce the gastric acid production. But in the cases of anaphylaxis, it can also be used in conjunction with our H1 antihistamines. And finally, a couple other things you might see is the application of medication such as our corticosteroids. The important thing to know is steroids aren't going to have any impact on the reaction that's currently going on. There is some thought around the prevention of rebound anaphylaxis, but there really hasn't been a whole lot of evidence to support this. But this is often a common course of treatment, especially considering that as many as 20% of patients can have a rebound anaphylaxis reaction. And so finally, one of the more common medications you may also see is going to be our albuterol. Now, while this medication in the midst of an anaphylaxis reaction is not going to relieve that bronchial smooth muscle contraction, in a patient who's having refractory wheezing and having difficulty breathing, it may provide them some relief. All right, so that sums up our discussion on our anaphylactic shock. And again, we talked about how this is a result of an interaction with an allergen leading to a massive release of histamine, which ultimately leads to our shock state. We talked about the two different causes, immunologic and non-immunologic, as well as the signs and symptoms that you would look to see if you had a patient who was in anaphylactic shock. 
And finally, we talked about some of the treatment modalities that you would be looking to do for your patient. I do hope that this explanation has helped to make this a little bit more understandable for you. And as always, I do want to thank you for watching this video, and I hope you found this lesson useful for you. Now, please, if you do like the video and you did find it useful, make sure and hit that like button down below, as it does really help get the word out about our channel. And in the comments below, tell us your favorite part of this video, as well as feel free to ask any questions that you may have. Finally, make sure and check out the next lesson in our series, which is going to be on neurogenic shock. Or you can also check out another one of our great series of lessons on hemodynamics. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next lesson.